I think what we're going to do is probably just kind of go over what the weight speed regulator is and maybe talk about some of the hardware choices you do when you're procuring it. And then after lunch break, uh, we'll come back in and we'll talk about how you would actually deploy a weight speed, how you would actually wire it up. We were just having a sidebar conversation again about the BMSs and, and you know the different ways that they are deployed. So I want to come back to this topic a bit. <clears throat> Bottom line, all BMSs, they will monitor the battery cells for hazardous or damaging conditions and they will pull the ripcord. They all do that. And it doesn't matter if it's a BMS inside the battery or if it's a BMS outside the battery with some communication or they've taken that BMS hardware and split it in half electrically and put some in the battery and some out. Doesn't matter. How the BMS is packaged, this is what I call a packaging issue when I'm designing it. Do I put all the functionality in this, in this package or do I put it all in this package or do I split it up? Doesn't matter. The value and the function that the BMS does, all of them. If the cells are going sideways, we're going to pull the ripcord. Another function that the BMS often does is balancing. So you've heard that you know, the cells as they get charged, you have to do balancing a bit. So typically what we see is what's known as top balancing. When you get to the, this portion of the charge process, most BMSs will start, they'll, they, they'll trigger around 14.2 volts their terminal charge is usually 14.4. Once the battery gets above 14.2, the top balancers will be enabled. Every battery is a little different, but that's pretty common. And what that is, is every little cell is a little different. And you're going to have one cell that's an overachiever. It's going to be a little bit more charged than the rest of these guys. So the BMS will recognize that. And the most common way to do it is what they call bleed resistors. So they'll actually put a little resistor across that one cell and they'll bleed energy off that cell, waste that energy as heat, to let the air cells catch up. There are other technologies, there's active balancers where they'll take that energy and put it into a distributed system and shove it back in. REC, active BMS, is probably the most common one I'm aware of. But by and large, most batteries you're going to be exposed to use top balancing with bleed resistors. Another function that a BMS will often do is they will report out what's going on. So from a consumer level, they'll talk to the cell phone. And you can be nosy and you can go in and you can see what's this cell at and what's that cell at and what's the temperature at and maybe it'll lie and tell you what the state of charge is. Um, we'll get into the horrific quality of state of charge uh, meters even with lithium batteries maybe a little bit later. But that's a consumer level thing where the battery you can often use a cell phone. Um, some of them will allow you to communicate with external devices. The Victron Servo is a great example and with the VRM. So you as an installer can monitor a boat worldwide what's going on with that battery through the VRM. You can go in and see the cell levels and all that kind of stuff. That's another function that some BMSs will do. External consumer level communications. Some BMSs will provide an external, I'm getting pissed, stop doing what you're doing. I call it a wiggle wire, charge enable wire, charge disable wire. The battery's getting stressed and before the BMS opens the contactor and opens the charge bus, it will signal out through this wiggle wire to stop doing what you're doing. Case in point, um, the Victron VE bus BMS. That's how that particular product works, okay? That wheel wire will go inactive and the wake speed will turn off and stop providing charging and then hopefully the condition will clear. And if it doesn't, if it continues on because you've got some big giant solar panels that were misconfigured, at some point that BMS will pull the ripcord, but we're fortunate because we've already shut stuff down safely and there's a really good reason for that. Another thing is that the BMS may have a richer way of communicating. And this is all relevant because when we talk about how to install the wake speed, we can support all these different levels and how you wire it up is going to depend on your battery. This last level is where the BMS has the ability to communicate directly with the wake speed. We use the CAN bus. The BMS is able to send messages to the wake speed. It's able to send messages that says, 
stop doing this. It's able to send messages, I'd like you to do this. It's able to send messages that says, I'm doing top cell balancing. So instead of sending me 200 amps, send me two. And the wake speed can take care of that. So the BMS, a very rich BMS, is able to not only protect your batteries, because they all do that, and communicate out what's going on, because many do that, and maybe also uh, provide a, a, a brute force yes or no signal, because some do that, they can say, this is how much. Those are kind of the different levels that a BMS can do. Don't get wrapped around whether it's external or internal. And I've seen these in the forums. And I learned a long time ago not to participate in forums. It's just, there's no value in that. So that's, you'll never see me on a forum for a reason. It doesn't matter if it's an external BMS, if it's an internal BMS. That is a designer's packaging decision. I'm going to listen to my marketing group and the requirements on the product, and I'm going to decide how much of the electronics I'm going to put here and here. May put them all here, may put them all here, may divide them up. Irrelevant. The thing that's relevant is the function that is provided. Is it a very basic BMS where the only thing it does is uh, protect the cells, or is it that the other extreme, a very rich BMS, where it has the ability to communicate out in real time, appropriate for process control, not just people being curious what's going on, but actually being an active part of the charging process. Does that help? Does that provide clarity on kind of this string of BMSs? And apparently not. All right. No, this is important. Let's go on. What establishes that interface, though? Is it all just like Nemo 2000, or does every manufacturer have their own, like, I don't know, API or something? All of the above. I see. So for you from WakeSpeed's side, you have to go to every manufacturer and get, I guess, you know, their SDK or their docs. Yep. You will see when we talk tomorrow <clears throat> about how to configure the wake speed, you will see where you select the battery. And you select the battery by brand and communications. There's probably half a dozen common communication protocols. Uh, there's RVC, there's J1939, there's uh, NEMA actually is, doesn't have sufficient capability to implement any of this, so we don't worry about it. There's SMA, there's LUX, there are proprietary protocols. It takes us anywhere from one to three man months to work with a given battery manufacturer to support these protocols and proof that it's a safe system, which is why we have a fairly finite list. Because so if it... You, sorry, so every time you do a firmware upgrade, you have to test against all of those? Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. We have a regression testing that we do, and we do major and minor. Yeah, major firmware upgrades are... Yeah, we, we, we use a whole process that comes from my experience in the career industry. And there are, you know, alpha, beta, release candidates, there's regression test. We have a whole list of stuff we do. But the, to answer your more direct question, um, there are a number of common standards. And we're going to talk about this with the CAN tomorrow. Because CAN is the mechanism that we use to physically move information back and forth. Then the protocol on top of it is the detail you just asked about. And some of them are published, and some of them aren't. We have proprietary relationships that we can't talk about. So some battery manufacturers use open industry standards, and some choose to do it their own way. That's these guys up here, right? <laughs> yes, sir. Are they usually encrypted, or can you just reverse engineer them? Like that? <coughs> yeah, you can sniff them. Absolutely, if you want to. I was thinking, like, you know, if you have, like, a Raspberry Pi or yeah. something else, you can just pump it uh, You know, just issue a command uh, $ESM colon 1 to the wake speed, and it turns it into a really expensive uh, can sniffer. It'd be like hooking up your Raspberry Pi with a can hat and uh, issuing uh, the Linux command can dump. So, yeah, you can sniff it if you want to. I mean, if you have no other purpose in life, like me, <laughs> and I've done that before, by the way. We, we are actually reverse engineering the Victron CAN protocol before we uh, establish direct relationships with Victron. Uh, we were going down that path. I wasn't, hadn't really made the decision we're going to productize it, but, uh, but 
fortunately, Victron saw value in us, and we now have a very detailed engineering level relationship with them. So we, they made changes on their side, and we made changes on ours. And there are some of those messages that are published, and there are some that aren't that we're utilizing. Yeah, I was thinking about it in terms of like, then there are lots of like, if you want to step out of the walled garden, can you do that? Um, given enough time and money and effort, you can do almost anything, right? That's kind of the answer. All righty. Um, so this is more going to be a preamble, and then we'll break for lunch, because uh, I often got asked on my boat if I fished a lot, and I told them no. I was an eater. And there's fishing and eating, and this thing in the middle that had to happen, and it just pissed me off why it didn't happen. So I'm an eater, so we'll break for lunch. <laughs> um, Wake speed regulator, a lot of this is kind of a summary overview for you. So a lot of these questions we've already answered. The wake speed considers the battery. What's the temperature, voltage, and current? What are the needs and status of the battery? It considers the alternator. What is the temperature of the alternator? What is the RPMs? Uh, there are load management aspects we'll touch on in a bit. But for example, if you put a 5K watt head on a one lung, one lung, four horsepower Swedish auxiliary sailboat engine, do you have any idea what happens when they try to move our port? It doesn't work. So we have the ability to accommodate for that through white space is technology we use in engine loading. Um, we also look at, that's actually a lead in for, for the motor, the load demand. That's exactly what I was talking about. There are other uh, aspects that come into play. I will tell you, if you want to really differentiate yourself, this is an aspect that is not really used very much in the wake speed. And we'll cover this more uh, tomorrow. We also consider the system because we're monitoring the battery current. Remember that tail current that's coming in? Because I'm not guessing at it by looking at how hard I'm driving the alternator, not only am I guessing where the energy is going, but I also have no clue if the solar panels are putting in energy. So from the wake speed's perspective, because we're actually listening to the battery, that tail current could be coming from the alternator, could be coming from the solar panels. More relevant, uh, batteries have a C-rate limit. What's the maximum current you can pump into them when you're in bulk mode, when you're really, really trying to hammer energy into it? The wake speed is able to know how, what that limit is and how many amps are going into the battery. And especially with large solar panel installs, we have a number of conditions where the solar panels might be putting in 100, 150 amps, and we'll throttle back the wake speed and only put in maybe 75 amps so that we don't exceed the C rate on the battery. So that's the, that's the thing that the wake speed considers. What's going on with the battery? What's going on with the alternator? What's going on with the engine? And what's happening with the whole system? A lot of stuff that's being considered. And then we drive what to do based on the full sensing we are multiple regulator, and more so it's not just uh, make break, it's not a, a, a bang bang regulator, it's a PID. We anticipate, I think I mentioned earlier on that we had that one customer where the alternator was going like a rocket in this temperature rise. We would see that change, that's the D. Proportional in the grand differential, that's the D aspect. That D was too high, so we backed off on the alternator. We'll do the same thing with voltage. If we're rising up toward batteries when they charge, they, uh, lithium batteries especially, they have this curve that starts going like this. If we start seeing the rate of change going too high, even though we're not at a terminal voltage, we'll start backing off to prevent ourselves from overshooting. So it's a multi-regulator intelligent regulation. We are flexible. That one product will support any system voltage from 12 to 48, 52 volts. Uh, it will do 12, 24, and 48 volt selections automatically, samples the battery voltage startup, and decides what the multiplier to use is. But you can manually put something in. If you've got a um, 32 volt fishing vessel, is the perfect example. There is no regulator out there except these things that were made in the 60s for those guys. We did an install because the fishing vessel said, I'm tired of having to replace $4,000 worth of lead-acid batteries every two years. They were being chronically, in that case, they were chronically overcharged, weren't they, Rick? Yeah. So there's uh, an example. The same product can support all those things. One skew. 
Uh, we can do uh, N-type and P-type with different harnesses. We can communicate with uh, the CAN, whether you're talking to a BMS or whether you're talking to uh, uh, the display monitor, it doesn't matter. There's a lot of stuff we can do. NEMA 2000 displays, RVC-based displays, the Victron Servo, the VRM, a lot of information can go out. So that's, there's a lot of stuff that's gone into this. This particular product, I haven't done this for a while, but I think there's close to seven man years, eight man years, easy of development into this thing. It's, uh, we've been doing this for a long time and uh, you get to get the benefit of it. All right. The Wake Speed 500 has a number of configuration options. That's one of its benefits. Its greatest weakness is that it has a number of configuration options. You know that saying, your greatest strength, your greatest weakness? This is it. So we will talk about ways to configure the regulation, regulator. There are simple ways to do it, just using dip switches. There's uh, really appropriate ways to do it using the Wake Speed app, which I'll remind you if you haven't done it, make sure you download it on your cell phones. There's really hard and painful ways if you want to be a computer science nerd called editing the ASCII files directly. So we'll cover all that stuff. <clears throat> um, there is a document, uh, there are documents out on the website that can help you understand um, the different aspects of the wake speed. And we'll cover a few of those things after lunch here. But go and look at the wake speed website, go look on the product tab, and there's documents about installation guides, there's documents about the various batteries that we know we support, and there's some example of how to wire those things up. There is a really painful 100 page document called the wake speed communication configuration guide that really goes into the guts but if you really are going to try to take advantage of all the aspects the wake speed can do, and I'll tell you very few people do, that's where all your answers are at. That, we call that the Bible. Uh, there's also a learn tab, and it's got a lot of videos on it on how to use different aspects. Uh, one of your best friends is going to be something called the wake speed, um, wake speed buyer's guide. So you want to make sure you go and look at that, maybe over lunch if you want to take a peek at the learn tab um, and see what kind of stuff you, you can find. So we will uh, be done now, and uh, what we're going to do for the rest of today is talk about how you would pick the hardware aspect of the wake speed, the different hardware options, and the different wiring approaches given largely these batteries that I just talked about with the BMSs. And then tomorrow, we're going to talk about how to do the greatest strength of the wake speed and do it in a way that's not going to end up with less hair.